Hello and welcome to this British Academy event. I'm Frahana Haider. I'm a journalist and broadcaster and a presenter of the BBC World Service programme Witness History, which looks at important events in history through the eyes of the people who are there. This event is part of Why History, a series which we, in which we hear from British Academy fellows and funded researchers to discuss insights from the past to help us make sense of the present. I am delighted to be joined this evening by Dr. Alexander Sposnik. Alex is a senior lecturer in late medieval history at King's College London and is a former British Academy Leatherhume Small Research Grants Award holder. Her work covers the economy, the environment, culture and society in late medieval Britain and Europe. Her recent research has focused on bees and beekeeping in this period, and she is joining us today to discuss this tiny creature's extraordinary role in medieval society. Alex and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes before taking a selection of audience questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please submit this via the Q&A function. As always, you are of course welcome to tweet during the event and can copy in at British Academy. Alex, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and of course for the small grant that started this research. Alex, what I would really love to know, let's start off with, what drew you to look at bees in this period? Ah, uh, well, um, you know, as we know, bees have really been much in the news recently and we're really increasingly aware of how important bees and pollinators are, um, and also of the interconnectedness of our ecosystems. And so I guess I kind of had bees on the brain, like everyone does, but I'm a medievalist. Um, and so I also think about medieval things. And it struck me that bees are actually really evident in medieval sources. Mm -hmm. So we have stray swarms of bees, we have people stealing swarms of bees, and then arguing about it, who has the wax, who has the honey from them. We have different kinds of entries in different sorts of accounts and documents. And so I was thinking that within the context of my own research, Actually, there are a lot of bees, and this is something that's really different mm -hmm. um, from the modern period. And at the same time, another strand of my research is about medieval peasants and how the very, very poor earned a living. And it's something that's written in the literature is um, that peasants could have made extra money keeping bees. This is just sort of a throwaway comment that historians have made. If they needed to make money, they could have kept bees. Mm -hmm. I'm not a beekeeper. So I wondered, you know, can anyone keep bees? Is it easy to keep bees? How much money could you make from keeping bees? And that was really the start of the project. And sort of addition to that, um, we know that bees are really environmentally sensitive. And so they can also tell us a lot about landscapes of the past and human mm. intervention in those landscapes. And those are all things that really interest me. So Alex, you, you raised some of the questions there yourself, but I mean, how easy was it for people to keep bees during this time? Was it something that anyone across the UK or Europe could do? That's a good question. So the, the project started looking at England uh, and it was really hard to keep bees in England. Mm. They were always being washed away. It was cold, it was rainy. They were kept in um, skeps, which are kind of upside down wicker baskets that were kept up on little platforms to keep them away from the rain and to try to keep them away from the cold. Um, and it wasn't hugely successful. I mean, most of the time when we have entries about beekeeping in manorial accounts, which were the accounts that landlords kept um, to track agriculture on their lands, mm -hmm. the accounts just say, um, and there was no honey this year because all the bees died because of the big rain. So it's really hard to keep bees in medieval England, but at the same time, there was also tons of beekeeping here anyway. So there was a lot of wax and honey that was still being produced despite the adverse conditions and the small scale beekeeping. But if we expand out and we think more broadly about Europe, <clears throat> well, the extent of the European honeybee spans from Iberia to the Urals and from Southern Scandinavia to North Africa. Mm -hmm. And there was beekeeping in the whole of that region. And all of that beekeeping took different forms and was adapted to specific conditions. Mm. So for example, we have tree beekeeping in Eastern Europe moving into Russia, which was a form of sort of managed wild beekeeping. 
um, which is kind of cool. They hollowed out really big cavities and tree trunks, and then they put sort of a false door over it with a little hole for the bees to fly in and out of. And the bees just filled up these enormous cavities with wax and honey. And then the beekeeper would come and lift off the door um, and collect these huge quantities of bees mm. and honey. Um, but that's really land extensive. It needs lots of space and lots of trees. Um, and it sort of, it protected the bees from the really cold winters of that region. And if we look you know, at the other extreme in Iberia, we see the presence of cork hives, which insulated the bees against that really intense heat of the summer. Um, and the cork was also light and it was easy to move, which was useful in that region because they moved the bees from summer and winter foraging areas in a kind of bee transhumans. And between those two extremes, there were lots of other kinds of beekeeping, but each adapted to the circumstances of the region. And also within that region of the entirety of Europe, um, it was also easier to keep bees in some regions than others. So if we think about the Mediterranean, like really ideal bee conditions, it was really nice and it was warm and there were lots of flowers. Um, but at the same time, there was beekeeping on a really vast scale in the hinterland of the Baltic as well, which has basically the opposite conditions. So interesting. So Alex, what type of people kept bees? Who were these beekeepers? Ah, so this is actually a hard question to answer. Yeah. Um, because what we know about beekeepers really depends on the sources that we have. Mm. So all kinds of people kept bees, um, but a lot of the sources that we have, especially the sources from Northern Europe, are accounts that are written by lords about their land. So they're really interested in, you know, getting as much money as they can for themselves um, and exerting rights and privileges over other people. <laughs> so what they record it has to do with how do I get as much money as I can and how can I exert these rights? Right. Um, and so they kind of give us a really top down sort of um, impression um, of beekeeping, among other things. Um, so we have really well documented groups of special beekeepers, um, but small scale peasant beekeeping is less easy to see. Mm -hmm. And we're also constrained by what people chose to write down. Mm -hmm. So a really nice example is that there's this really cool set of tax records from England in the 13th century. It's the 1225 lay subsidy. And for certain really specific administrative regions, um, they happen to contain lists of beehives owned by peasants. Um, and this just depends, you know, you have a really pedantic or overly detail oriented clerk who decides I'm going to spend my time writing that down. And you have these records which show you that actually there's tons of beekeeping that otherwise you mightn't have seen. So there's peasant beekeeping across England, across Europe, but there were also specialized beekeepers. And like, for example, in central Iberia, there were large scale bee ranches. And we also have really well-documented tree beekeepers who had a high status and special rights and privileges in parts of Germany and Eastern Europe and into Russia. And those existed alongside small-scale beekeeping. And then the other sort of aspect of, you know, who, get, who gets to keep bees mm. um, is that it could be a contested activity. So sort of in the um, hinterland of the Baltic and the lands of the Teutonic Order, the native peoples of the Baltic weren't allowed to keep the honey or all of the honey from their trees. And there's a lot of conflict and legislation over it. Right. And in Southern Europe, there's also civic legislation about like, where you can keep the bees so they don't interfere with other activities like vineyards for wine. So all of that also tells us that these were really highly managed landscapes mm -hmm. um, and that this legislation really helps us helps to tell us things about land ownership and land rights and what these landscapes look like. Yeah. So Alex, was there a hierarchy um, amongst beekeepers? Whether the elite beekeepers, whether more, as you mentioned there, peasant beekeepers, was there a hierarchy, would you say? Yes, yeah, so there, there are people who are special like it's not just that they are that they are beekeepers, but there are certain regions where 
specialized beekeepers have special rights and privileges. So an example of that um, would be in the area around Nuremberg in, um, in Germany, where we have an uh, example of this German tree beekeeping called Seidelwesen. And the Seidler, they have their own court. They um, wear like, they, I don't want to say uniform, but they have a special attire and they get to carry like special tools and weapons. And um, in other places, it's the ability to, for these tree beekeepers to go into other people's land that they can just kind of wander through the forest at will that confers on them high status. And that's like a totally different sort of social set from, you know, even specialized beekeepers in other regions, like the bee ranches um, in central Castile, where the people who work on those I mean, I'm calling them bee ranches, like big apiaries. Um, they don't own. They don't own it. It's owned by someone else. They just work it. Right. Interesting. So, in your research, Alex, what did medieval people observe about bees? What did you find out? Wow. This was really eye-opening. Medieval people. They were. They were hard thinkers, mm. and they. Um, they thought a lot about bees. So they thought that if you beat a dead cow to a pulp and then you buried it, you could grow bees. That was taken from Pliny the Elder. Um, they thought that bees were born without feet and afterwards they grew them and they, be, they were really strong. Um, that's, uh, that has to do with the Latin word for bee, which is apis. So they were born without feet, apes. You have to be really into Latin to enjoy that. Um, but medieval people were also really keen observers of the natural world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we shouldn't let get kind of pushed away amidst all of the sort of more fantastic things that they, they thought. So they knew that there were worker bees that had specific tasks that they carried out. And they knew that there was a big important bee, but crucially they thought that that was a king rather than a queen. Mm. Um, and they knew that bees went out to flowers, but they thought that they turned dew into honey and flowers into wax. And uh, probably the most important thing, and I think because they thought the queen was a king, they didn't observe any mating in bee colonies. And so they thought that bees grew from spontaneous generation. Why not? Um, and that became really culturally important in the Middle Ages because medieval Christian writers then drew parallels between the virginity and chastity of bees mm -hmm. and the virginity and chastity of Christ and Mary. Right. So interesting. So you touched on that, Alex, about this idea of bees being chaste and virginal. Could you tell us a bit more about the religious symbolism bees held in Christianity and why bees and bee products were so important to people's lives? Well, so the result of this connection between bees and Christ and Mary was that only beeswax candles could be used for the mass. And then this expanded over the central and later Middle Ages to basically cover all liturgical and devotional use um, of candles. And it drove this really huge thriving trade in beeswax for religious purposes, especially over say the 13th to 15th centuries. And I think from a, a modern perspective or from my perspective, I guess, um, it's really hard to imagine how important candles were to medieval Christians. I mean, every stage of their life from birth to death was marked with candles and every stage of the liturgical year used candles and candles were, I mean, just all over churches. They were hanging from the ceilings. They were on the altars. They were in front of the cross, the baptismal font. They played really important visual role in the mass. So candles were absolutely everywhere. And there were certain holidays like Candlemas and Easter that used, I mean, huge amounts of wax. Big churches and cathedrals could burn candles weighing hundreds of pounds to make these really impressive displays of light. Um, and they, you know, the Paschal candle, which is sort of the central part of the, the um, Easter 
celebration. Mm -hmm. um, in some cathedrals were said to like span the whole of the height of the cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, so they made them like really, really big and fancy. Um, and these, they spent lots of money on it um, because it, wax was really expensive. So this wax was also a way of um, showing off a conspicuous consumption, especially in the later Middle Ages. And actually, that um, conspicuous consumption and this really, like, I would say, over-purchasing of wax um, is what led me to the current project that I'm working on, um, which stems from a find from this small grant um, when I was in the archives of Westminster Abbey, which is such a treat. Um, and I was reading the sacrist accounts, and the sacrist was the monk who was in charge of the expenses for the chapel. Mm. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of things written down in these accounts. But what was really striking is that there was just so much wax, tons of it. And on average, Westminster purchased well over a thousand pounds of wax a year just for the main chapel. It's like wow. 1,300 pounds on average every year. That's a lot of wax. Well, it is a lot, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, well, <laughs> like, why are they buying so much wax? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, then what was really interesting about the Westminster accounts, mm. which are just amazing, um, is that they also list, and this again has to do with, you know, like what people choose to write down. Right. So they also wrote down where the wax was from. Mm. And that's unusual in accounts. And so they say that the wax is from Poland or it's from Lübeck, which is in Northern Germany, or even from Lisbon. I think they're writing it down to explain why they spent so much money on it. But expenses, <laughs> justifying. Because all of these accounts have been audited and people say, why, why did you spend that? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, you know, like, not only are they buying, you know, huge amounts of wax, but they're also buying it from really far away. Mm. And that opened my eyes really to this international trade in wax and of the economic impact of religious consumption in this period. It's really fascinating. These chance findings. Mm. Someone happened to keep the note. So yeah. did you come across, Alex, um, I mean, we talked about Christianity there, but did other religions use um, honey and wax significantly? Were they significant in other religions? Yeah, they were, but differently. So in Islam, bees were a symbol of sort of divine omnipotence. They combined sweetness and sharpness in both their honey and their venom. And in medieval Islam, honey was particularly important. Mm. And then <clears throat> there's also evidence of a similar kind of Jewish symbolism. So there is a... A question was asked of a 14th century rabbi, you know, why do we dip bread in honey between Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year, and Sukkot, which is a festival that comes after it? Yeah. Um, and the response is, oh, we do that to remind us both of the sweetness and the sharpness. Uh -huh. So similar kinds of ideas coming through there. That's interesting. We are already establishing, Alex, a picture of the importance of bees and honey and wax across Europe and North Africa. Um, we mentioned this earlier, you touched on it earlier, but what do we know about how bee products were traded internationally? I mean, you did, you know, look at that. We talked about that a bit before, but I'd love to know more about that. Uh, well, I could talk about that forever, but I won't. But <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is that um, a really unexpected, well, I found it unexpected aspect, um, is that the wax and honey trades were totally separate. Um, so they weren't traded from the same places or following the same trade routes, which I think is unexpected because, you know, wax is produced to store honey. So where there's wax, there's obviously also honey. Um, but there are two main wax producing zones on the hint, on the periphery of Europe, mm -hmm. um, the Baltic and the Maghreb. Yeah. And that Baltic wax was considered to be really just like peak wax. 
like the wax of the absolute highest quality. It was really expensive. You know, this was like luxury wax. So, you know, when the Westminster um, clerks wrote down in the Sacris account, oh, I spent like a fantastic amount of money on Polish wax. What they were saying is it was really fancy. Right. Um, and this was traded by German merchants into Bruges and London. And later with the Reformation, it was traded into northern Spain. Um, and I mean, tons of it was shipped across the Baltic and the North Sea every year. And it, I mean, we're talking, I mean, really, if you think about it sort of in terms of B, mm. many millions of bees every year required to produce the amount of wax that was just coming in um, through the sound and into, like, into Bruges or London. Um, but what's sort of interesting is that no one wanted their honey. <laughs> so they're shipping you know, huge quantities of one bee product, but the other bee product honey has no, no interest really. Um, it, it was consumed locally. Um, but I think it was probably, it was piney and it was maybe a little bit old and people were just like, well, we have our own honey. I don't think we want yours. Thank you. Um, and this is actually a region where we can see that there were some Mediterranean imports of honey. So um, they obviously, they, they had sort of different ideas of what these honeys tasted like. Um, and kind of the same thing is also seen in North Africa, but for different region, reasons. Mm -hmm. So North Africa was also a major wax producing zone. Um, wax was carried on pretty much every ship that left the ports of the Maghreb, especially from the region of what's now Alger Algeria. Um, but again, there really wasn't an export honey market from this region. So even though huge amounts of honey must have been produced, um, this is a region where there were probably two, maybe even three harvests of honey a year. Um, there were really special fragrant honeys from parts of like Morocco, which were said to taste of jasmine. I mean, really, you know, you would think this is not the same as the, as the Baltic. This is a place where they would really want these honeys and it's not exported into the um, northern Mediterranean. And this was because of the special role of honey in medieval Islam. So honey was thought to have healing powers, spiritual and physical, um, and eating honey cakes and biscuits and fritters was a big part of celebrations um, like that for the Maulid, which was the um, nativity of the prophet. Yeah. So they consumed lots and lots of honey themselves. But in that context, the wax is really more of a byproduct of that honey production. And they sold that on to Christians. Um, but if we think about honey, that long distance trade, those places where that like, especially desirable honey um, came from were places like Catalonia and Aragon, Provence and the Languedoc, uh, Portugal, parts of the Adriatic coast, Sardinia and Crete. And a lot of that honey trade, especially the trade from the Western Mediterranean um, was focused on provisioning the Levant. So the Alexandria, Beirut and Damascus were big honey consumers. Um, and then we also see that, I guess, delicious Mediterranean honey moving north into Northern Europe as well. I'm getting a real craving for honey, Alex. <laughs> Uh, talking about honey now, today you can find special honeys such as lavender or manuka. Were medieval people aware of how the local environment altered the honey or wax that could be produced? Yes, they were. Yeah, I mean, medieval people really knew what they liked and they knew what they didn't like. And just like today, um, they liked lavender honey. They liked chestnut honey. They liked this delicate honey from rosemary. Mm. There's a preference for the earlier harvested honey than the later harvested honey. And if we look at um, lists of goods that are available in different markets, we can see that they priced honey according to where it came from and that it had different prices. 
So, for example, in Damascus in the 14th century, the honey from Mequinensa in Zaragoza, Spain, but that was like the premium, premium honey. That was the most expensive honey. And it's more expensive from the honey from Catalonia, which is really, really close to Mequinensa. So even though those two regions are very close, they absolutely knew um, that the ecology of particular places lent themselves to especially um, palatable honeys. Mm. Um, but sort of at the, by the same token, they also knew that trees like strawberry tree, Arbutus, um, made really bitter honey. Mm. Um, there, there was a niche medieval market for bitter honey. Mm. There's a niche market for ivy honey today, which is also bitter. So, um, And there was also a lot of concern um, about adulterating honey, even if so today people are worried about adulterating honey because people add sugar to it. Um, but in the Middle Ages, you could adulterate things with all sorts of stuff. Um, but they even were concerned with adulterating honey just by mixing it, a fancy honey with a less fancy honey um, to the damage of the price that you could get for it. Looking now at the environment, Alex, bee populations today are very fragile and are hugely affected by human intervention, habitat loss, environmental change. Was the same true in the medieval period? Yes, on a number of levels. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's a difference because they didn't have, you know, pesticides. and, um, But similar kinds of other mechanisms were at play. So um, I think contextually, there are sort of two factors to keep in mind that affect the whole, affected the whole of medieval society um, and economy. And the first is that from about the year 1000 to the turn of the 14th century was a period of really dramatic population growth. Right. And that this had led to settlement expansion and increasing the intense ways of using and using up resources, especially land and soil, um, and of deforestation to make room for settlements in many places, um, and the expansion of arable agriculture or cereal agriculture um, at the expense of other kinds of landscapes, which were more conducive to bee forage. So that's one aspect is that there's this background of really important settlement expansion. And then the second factor is that at the turn of the 14th century saw the end of the medieval warm period. Um, and in Northern Europe, um, the weather became much colder and wetter and it sort of slid into what we know of as the little ice age um, that so affected the early modern period. Mm -hmm. um, and that change in weather and climate was really lousy for people and agriculture. There was a huge famine at the beginning part of the beginning of the 14th century. But these are also adverse um, conditions for bees. Um, and then all of the landscapes in which beekeeping took place were affected to some degree by human intervention in the environment. So the forests where that tree beekeeping took place um, were under tremendous pressure from all kinds of other activities, um, timber felling, you know, for building, um, charcoal burning, um, which was used to smelt iron, which was needed for all the tools that people needed for these settlements. Um, and all of that impinged on bee habitats. So the use of forests was really strictly managed. Um, but that kind of tree beekeeping could only take place in thinly populated regions. And where there were more people, the trees were felled to make room for these settlements. And most arable crops don't provide forage for bees. There are exceptions to that, buckwheat, for example, but you know, cereal crops don't, by and large, um, provide forage for bees. So in turn, the settlement expansion curtailed bee habitats. And then with the climate change, well, bees don't fly out in cold weather or rain. Mm. Flowering vegetation is affected by sunlight, precipitation, temperatures. 
So that increasing coldness of that period probably also adversely affected bees. It's something that I really want to be able to pinpoint and quantify much more precisely for the medieval period because modern studies show that to be the case. Mm. But I just, I would like to be able to quantify that in a more precise way um, for my period, for the medieval period. Um, so a lot of that, um, especially the coldness has to do with Northern Europe. But further south, um, if we think about the Mediterranean, the biggest impact um, on the landscape of the Mediterranean was deforestation. Right. And part of that was sediment expansion, but part of it was in very large part due to pastoralism. So herding sheep and goats, which involved a really extensive use of fire. And I think that's, that's interesting because I think we think deforestation is basically bad. Just generally deforestation is bad. Yeah. But in terms of bee forage, in this context, it created a kind of landscape called maki or garig, which was absolutely full of bee forage. So plants like rosemary, cystus, asphodel, sage, blooming for most um, or all of the year. So in that context, this extreme change in landscape, which was also anthropogenic, was not necessarily bad for bees. Right. But I would counterbalance that by saying that there's also still settlement expansion in that region and that the places where beehives could be was curtailed and that did set limits on agriculture. Um, so, and also, you know, we would think, especially in the Southern Mediterranean, we would think about extreme aridity and that's exacerbated by deforestation and can also affect bees um, and uh, flowering plants um, as well. So I think what I would say is that in the Middle Ages, like today, bees were vulnerable to climate change right. and to human intervention in the landscape which did encroach on their habitats and it did need managing. But I think that the difference might be that medieval people saw a need to manage that, which maybe we've forgotten about. Alex, well, we've got lots of really interesting questions coming in already, but um, before we go to those, um, I really would love to ask you do you think there is anything we can learn today from how the people of the medieval period valued bees yeah I do actually I think that what really stands out to me is the wonder and the awe that bees inspired in medieval people I think they saw these tiny golden creatures which they imagined to be flung from paradise and they valued them and they imbued them with cultural significance. They saw them as intrinsically bound up in what it meant to live in medieval society. And I think that if we take the relig religious aspect out, um, that the inherent respect that medieval people showed these insects, the way they saw them as underpinning so many different things, um, I think maybe we can think about the extent to which our ecosystems are connected and fragile and complicated and also try to manage and protect them and maybe also even find something of that same wonder. Okay. Alex, we're going to go to some questions now and um, I'm going to go actually to um, one that's a hot topic among UK beekeepers. Um, okay. Someone is asking, at the moment, is the import, uh, importation of bees from other countries, is there any evidence, Alex, to suggest that the live bee colonies, hives, were traded widely, internationally even, during this period, so, during the medieval period? This is a good and hard question that I've never been asked before. I would say I haven't seen any direct evidence of it, but... At the same time, I would say probably in regions where you were moving hives around from one place to another, that you're more likely to have a kind of mixing of different um, bee, um, bee types um, that might 
might have led to it, but it's not something as extreme as, um, you know, I, I, the, the sort of um, hegemony of Italian honeybees, for example, um, that the, the bee types were I, more separated out in this period. Lovely, thanks, Alex. Um, Hazel, Alex is asking, have you found much evidence in visual records of bees beekeeping in this period? Interesting question. Yeah, so it shows up um, in a number of different contexts um, where you have, so especially in bestiaries, which are sort of compendia explaining um, a particular series of different animals and you know, what medieval people thought of them and why they have those names and things like that, um, and the bee features in them. Um, so there are manuscript uh, illustrations of bees and of beekeepers, and, um, and even one, I found one of a, a dog being stung in the nose by a bee. Um, and that's what shows us, actually, it's the, the imagery that we can see in manuscripts from across Europe shows us the kinds of beekeeping that took place there. And that's how we know, um, for example, it complements documentary evidence, but it's further evidence that in England, they used um, these woven skeps and that they did have them up uh, on platforms. And the kinds of differences in the illustrations helps us to know more about different kinds of beekeeping. Interesting. Um, Tony is asking um, Alex, was much honey used for the production of mead? And was this traded around Europe? Ah, uh, this is a super question. Um, yes, um, honey was certainly brewed into mead. Um, it's something that one of the postdocs on the project that I currently lead um, is working on right now. Um, so I shouldn't want to preempt his, his findings, but um, mead is a high status drink. Um, we think of it probably like within an English context, we think of it probably as being um, more of an early medieval kind of drink, Beowulf, um, for example. But um, it, it persists in certain parts of, of the Baltic throughout the, uh, the late medieval period. It's not, I wouldn't say it was traded widely though. It's a, a niche taste by the later medieval period. Alex, David has a two part question, which I think is really interesting. He's asking chemically, why would wax from these regions have been preferred, do you think? Were these waxes structurally better and his follow-up is, the Romans preferred certain types of wax for their color and strength, as they also wrote on it as wax tablets for record keeping. Okay, yes, all right. Um, so I think that structurally, I wouldn't say it's probably different. I think that the difference is that the wax that comes from the Baltic is considered really pure and really white. So what they're valuing here is the whiteness, basically. And the wax that comes from the Maghreb, they haven't processed it. We know they haven't processed it because we see the processing happening later on um, in Spain and Portugal and these places. So that wax is sort of yellowy and it needs further processing. Um, so this clean, white, pure wax, um, which the Hansa merchants, the German Hansa merchants who monopolized it, um, kept really strict controls over. And they're really always angry with the Russians for trying to adulterate it. Um, the difference then is less sort of structural and more sort of how clean and pure is it. Having said that, yellow wax has its place um, in the Mediterranean. Yellow wax candles are used, especially in sort of funereal um, contexts. Um, yes. So also in the medieval period, they use wax um, for tablets and for lost wax casting and for wax seals. And it has lots of other uses um, as well. Okay. Jenny is asking something and she has a really lovely comment. She says, thanks so much uh, for this talk. It's really fascinating. Thank you, Jenny. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm finding it really fascinating too, Alex. Um, and then she asked, you mentioned about North Africa and the Middle East, but did honey or wax get traded further afield? Okay. Um, 
So with the um, conquest of the, of the new world um, and the um, conversion of the, of the native peoples there, um, the Catholic church expanded. Um, and so they begin to export wax um, into the new world because there aren't honeybee, honeybees aren't native um, to the Americas. So it is exported um, to support this um, endeavor um, in, in, in large quantities, actually. Um, it's not something that um, I've studied in a lot of depth, so I'm a little bit at the edge of what I know, <laughs> but we do see it going on ships out from Seville and into the New World and from Cadiz and into the New World. Um, if it's traded further the other way, Possibly, but I'm afraid that that, again, stretches the, the realm of my knowing. That's why these questions are so good, Alex. But it's a good question. They always, they always push on. I should say um, the Black Sea is also a region um, of apiculture and honey and wax production. Interesting. Um, Teresa has a very interesting question, I think. Did monastic communities have any particular role to play with beekeeping at all? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I guess I thought that I'd find more of was apiculture within monastic complexes, mm -hmm. because um, if you go to a monastery, you often see bee um, niches in the walls. Um, and there's evidence from um, the gardener's accounts or the cellarer's accounts of different monastic um, houses of, of beekeeping within them. Um, what I do kind of wonder, and something I'd like to think about a bit more, is the extent to which that beekeeping was actually like, used as a sort of important thing to supply the order with honey and wax. Certainly, it was never enough to produce enough wax for what they needed, but in some cases, it might have been enough to supply enough honey. Um, so how far was it functional, but how far was it um, because bees also had this symbolic meaning, not just about Christ and Mary, which I focused on today, but also about like, well-ordered monastic societies. Um, and so how much of it was also kind of to remind them of those things. Interesting. Um, Alex, Catherine is asking, Jewish people eat apple and honey and honey cake at the New Year. Did this also happen in the Middle Ages? Well, again, this is something I want to look more into the consumption in a Jewish context of, um, of honey. Mm. Um, I can't directly answer that, but what I can answer is similar and related to that, which is about um, the traditional use of honey um, when Jewish children learn the Hebrew alphabet, that the letters are written in honey um, and then licked off of the board or the, the plate um, to, because of the sweetness, right? To, to make them, um, you know, connect the sweetness with, with the, the Hebrew alphabet that they have to learn. And, they, um, and that is definitely something that they do uh, in the Middle Ages as well. Uh, Liza is um, also talking about something that you mentioned um, previously, um, a subsidy in uh, uh, 1225. And she would be grateful if you could say more about that. Ah, OK. So this is from I looked at it a long time ago. <laughs> so the 13th century lay subsidy. This is really going back. So the lay subsidy was a tax on movables. And I don't want to say anything wrong, mm -hmm. so I won't say anything more. But what they did was they also wrote down, um, I think that they were writing down livestock. Um, and in this case, the person decided, I'm just going to write it all down. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're interested in it, I can remember who the editors were. And it was um, a husband and wife, Kazel and Kazel. Fascinating. Excellent. Um, and another question, this one from Paulina. So thank you, Paulina. 
Were there beekeeping manuals? This is really interesting. Did you come across any, Alex? So there's an... Agricultural treatises mention beekeeping, mm. um, uh, but they're kind of light on detail. So again, in an English context, the most famous um, medieval uh, agricultural treatise is Walter of Henley, and he tells you how much wax and honey you should get from a hive, or maybe just how much honey you should get from a hive. But what he's saying really is, if you don't get this, you need to watch your officials more carefully. Um, then later in the early modern period, Thomas Tusser's 500 points um, on husbandry does discuss, um, you know, you should put where you should put the hive and how you should keep them up on the little pedestals. Um, it's all in rhyme. Um, and um, other agricultural treatises also discuss beekeeping, but it's often sort of derivative it's often sort of explaining kind of a, generally about the bee rather than about how would you actually keep a bee and then how would you extract the honey and wax from the hive mm -hmm. nice interesting um we've got another interesting question that's come in um uh, this one's uh, doesn't have a name but um the question is, um, they're asking, interested by the fact people knew things in the local environment changed the taste of honey. Did they do things like plant specific things to encourage this or to support their bees? So we have some limited evidence of that. Um, certainly, and in my mind, it's Pliny again, who says, don't carry, don't have your bees near the strawberry tree because it ruins the taste of the honey. Um, but that could be wrong. Um, but in the, the, I think in the 16th century, there's an agricultural treatise um, that does specifically say, you know, we need to increase bee forage and talks especially about, I want to say about, um, increasing the amount of rosemary that's um, being uh, planted. Um, yes, I think so. Yes, it's the Castilian Gabriela Lanza de Herrera mm -hmm. who mentions it. Interesting. Um, Alex, Becky would like to know, um, she's interested to know if they used um, propopolis from the hives or was this discarded? Ah, yes, um, no, actually they don't. Um, and there's an interesting um, article, I think from like the National Institutes of Health in the US about how basically it was used in the ancient, uh, in antiquity, um, and then it stops being used and then it starts to be used again later on. So this is a period where they actually don't use it. Okay. Um, Chris is talking about a very interesting museum. He's asking, have you ever visited the Bee Museum in Slovenia? It's fascinating. The Slovenes are very proud of their, I'm, I don't want to pronounce this incorrectly, so apologies, Chris, if I do, the Carni, Carniola bees and export them wide, ah, yes. worldwide. There are bees kept on balconies and on rooftops. Wow, it sounds amazing. In the capital city. Um, they also have special little beehive boxes placed on trolleys in the meadows. That's very pleasing. I haven't been, but from what you describe, I would love to go. Sounds amazing, um, Chris. Um, uh, another question coming in, Alex. Tony is asking, is there any evidence to suggest the beekeepers back then would attempt to uh, attempt to overwinter the bee their bees as we do now? Yeah, this is part of the problem with why they don't produce as much honey as we might think that they do. So in England, for example, I know I keep coming back to England, but it has good examples, specific examples. Um, they um, harvest the honey only every two years. And a lot of the honey that's being produced is actually being used um, as fodder to feed the bees to overwinter them. So there, there's a lot um, sort of in the literature about being careful that you um, have enough honey uh, to keep the bees over the winter. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that, and that's, you know, why not a huge amount of honey is actually being harvested from these hives. Right, interesting. And uh, Loza has a follow-up question. She says, thank you for the subsidy info. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, so thank you, Alex. Are bees well represented in bestiaries or generally ignored because they are insects? Also, um, and she says it's all very interesting. So uh, thank you, Liza. So Alex, can you answer that? Yeah, they are. They're fortunately um, one of the animals that is included in bestiaries. Interesting, interesting. Um, Alex, um, before we go, um, I want to find out, um, we've talked so much about bees, it's all been so fascinating, but um, where are you planning to take your research next? Well, that is an excellent question. So I should say um, at the moment, I'm wrapping up a three-year project funded by the Leverhulme Trust, which has two postdocs, Mark Whelan and Luis Salasi Fava, who have helped with the research that I've been talking about today within a European context. Um, and so what this research has really emphasized to me is how can the different ways that natural resources and the environment are obviously connected to the resources that are then produced and sold on and the cultural value of those and the many different actors of different religions and different um, ethnicities who are involved in that trade, which is so intrinsically rooted in the natural history of those places. Mm -hmm. And those are ideas that I want to explore more within the sort of interconnected ecological environments of the Middle Ages. It's fascinating. I sneaked in my own question there, but there is a, <laughs> there is a question from Kelly that I should have asked. So um, she asked, Alex, is, do you know the modern equivalent costs that people were paying for honey back then? So wh what does it equate to now? Can I have a moment on the internet? I can tell you, I know the price <laughs> of a gallon of honey. Yeah, yeah that was a kind of calculator question. It's a good question though. It's a good question. It's because we did touch on how expensive and um, honey. It is a good more. question, um, but they're paying about a shilling per gallon. Um, so it's not hugely expensive, um, but it also, this is maybe interesting, it tends to retain its price even with the advent of sugar imports. Oh, that is interesting. Alex, um, it's been so fascinating. Thank you so much for um, telling us so much about bees in the medieval period. And it's, I've learned so much and um, thank you. And thank you to our audience for tuning in and asking those very insightful questions. Um, they were really all interesting. I think you would agree, Alex. I would definitely agree. And I'll think about them. Um, so that's the end of our event for today. You can find out about future British Academy events on their website and social media channels. And previous editions of the Why History series are all available on the Academy's YouTube channel. I mean, it's a really interesting collection. So I would encourage you to have a browse and take a look. Alex, thank you again for your fascinating uh, talk and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.